Britain is a green and pleasant land, but for how long? We now get into a situation where any site's worth putting a planning application in for. After the biggest shake-up of the planning system in 40 years, the race is on to get Britain building. If I have a house here, I'm thinking about building a sort of Berlin Wall. It's got to be at least six feet high. So constructors are making plans. Whoever designed that needs to be shot. Objectors are making noises. We've had bloody enough of it with what we got in this town for councillors and the load of they're putting up. And neighbours are going to war. We always won our battles as a family. We'll win this one. In the firing line, shaping the country of the future, are Britain's plans. So nothing happens in the hall, yeah? Yes. No. Yes. No? Oh. Yes? No? Yes? Well, thank you for letting us visit. And um, we'll see you on Thursday. Another British planning cock-up, really. <laughs> Most planners spend their days dealing with homeowners and housing developers. Every now and then, an application arrives that's a little out of the ordinary. Planner Judith Gordon is near the villages of Lostock Green and Latch Dennis in Cheshire. This is what the proposed site layout entails. And we're standing round about here. And then this would be the building itself. It would be similar size, probably, to a bungalow. It may look like a detached house with a lot of parking spaces and a large chimney, but it is, in fact, a crematorium. We haven't dealt with um, a new private crematorium before, so it's a, a process of learning for everybody involved. It's long grass, isn't it? It's really long. Raiders might have been more... <laughs> Some of my colleagues have said, I wish I was dealing with that. I think they'd maybe like to accompany on certainly visits to crematoriums and see what really goes on and dispel some of the myths that people have. <laughs> Last year, planners received just a handful of applications to build private crematoria. Three of those were from father and son Howard and Jameson Hodgson. They're hoping to build their next crematorium in Cheshire, but their flagship development is in South Wales. We wanted people to feel that it was professional, that it was comfortable, that it was like a five-star hotel, but at the same time, it, it wasn't mauve curtains and, and very Victorian, depressing death, but it was sombre, but yet still tastefully done. And I think, you know, we've achieved that. These are very modern colours but at the same time, they are restrained. They're not jazzy. Most crematoria are council-owned. The Hodgsons have spotted a gap in the market and charge upwards of £500 for services at their memorial parks. The public's biggest single complaint would definitely be that they're in a conveyor belt. And so the whole thing is designed so they won't see anybody else out there, they won't hear anybody else behind them here, they will exit over there from a different way, and we have 45-minute times, whereas the usual is, can be in a very busy crematorium, 20, more usually probably 30. I've grown up in this business. Uh, I remember when I was very young, my sister and I had easily the fastest sledges because they were made of coffin boards. Howard sold his undertaker business for £7 million. Private crematoria are his latest venture, and he spent nearly £100,000 on the application in Cheshire. The reason that we would want to build it um, is because it's needed. We're looking to service in the region of 140,000 people. So it is there for community benefit. It's also worth remembering that any one of these that's built by us will cost something between 3.5 to 4 million pounds. That's a big investment and we have to know that there is a need. If it's not going to do a thousand cremations a year, then it's not going to give us our money back. Crematoria have to be at least 200 yards from neighbouring buildings, 
which is why Memoria have picked the Cheshire site. Be quite small in terms of the the general landscape, but uh, we need to consider what kind of impact that's going to have on this. You know, it's rural in nature, it's virgin agricultural land. This kind of application is something that's going to provoke a response. The locals seem to be fairly anti. The proposed site lies on a B road, half a mile between the two villages. The locals have wasted no time putting pen to paper. Among them, national newspaper cartoonist That's wrong way around. Bill Stott. Where the crematorium is going to be is a lovely meadow. It's really nice. It's full of that green stuff called grass. I'd far rather it stayed like that. I just feel sad that the developers, a, a, a company from down south, can come up here and bulldoze in our village, not knowing anything about it, the people, the place. We have a farm. Mm. Just a so, farm yeah. is what we have. Yeah. It's farmland. Mm. What we don't want is a damn great chimney and crematorium ruining a fantastic piece of Cheshire countryside. One of their big worries is the amount of speeding traffic the crematorium could bring through the villages. We might have another fast car coming there. Exactly. Here we go, look at the yeah. speed of this one. Oh. Oh. This is not uh, an infrequent occurrence. This is regular. This is a rural, rural lane. There will be probably seven funerals a day. That's 14 trips if you count going home again. Well going home again, minus one. In Lancashire, self-made millionaire Colin Burrell is working on his current project. Three new homes in Oldham. I'm 72. I'm still going and I get up between six and half past every morning and I might not go in for my tea till ten o'clock at night. That's truth, that. Right, well, then a big deal. Collins made a fortune buying up derelict properties and selling them on. If you want something, you've got to work for it. Nobody will give you an out. Although this country seems to give everybody something for now. I shouldn't say that, should I? <laughs> For his latest project, he's teamed up with his friend, kitchen entrepreneur Mark Harrington, and architect Andy Woodward. They want to build five log cabins as holiday homes on land Colin owns in the village of Birtle, on the outskirts of Rochdale. So they're a kind of a traditional log cabin, a traditional log home. Two bedrooms, a kitchen, a bathroom and a, and a living area. It's not going to look like your traditional caravan site or anything like that. It, it, it fits in with the rural aspect. It's very low impact. The main reason we're going for log cabins is because we think it's in keeping with the area. The footpaths are going to be built from something like chippings or, or, or bark that will allow water to go through and so they won't affect the trees or anything. We just wanted to put together a quality development. It's not... Which we think we've done. Yeah. And if you're not going to get planning approval for this here, you're not going to get a planning approval for it anywhere at all. They hope to rent the cabins out and encourage tourism in Rochdale. The Rochdale Tourist Board have been very, very excited because they know that there's a lack of, of quality dwellings for tourists on this side of the town. Yeah. Well, it's a nice place out for a millionaire even here. Yeah. Yeah. You know, on the working man as well. I think the people around you'd be quite proud of it, actually. This is your dog, Julie, isn't it? It is. What's he called? Maisie. She... Maisie, are you come to help in the woodland? But the villagers are already proud of Bertle. In the past, they fought off plans for a quarry and have created an action group to protect the look of the village. 
Oh, we are an action group, yes. Um, sometimes we don't feel very active in the pub when we're having a meeting. But yes, we, we, we are an action group. We, we act and we react to things. Depends what they are. When they saw the plans for the log cabins, they reacted. We don't want the log cabins because it's inappropriate development on the green belt and it's just on the edge of the conservation area. There are more reasons, um, but those are the main ones. Are you a local person? Although I'm an incomer, I've lived here for 42 years and, you know, we have tried very hard to preserve it. As, as you can see, it is a lovely spot. It's got a lot of character. But trying to keep Bertle Oh, Bertle Beautiful. Right, I think that's full. The Bertle Trust has written to the planning department asking for the cabins to be refused. I, I bet half of them people what lived there are all coming in as anyway. I bet they weren't the original ones what worked in the mills. They think there's some special coming in us. Every time you go and build something, people think, oh, what's going on? But they wouldn't be in their houses. The best outcome for Bertel would be that it's refused. Keep Bertel green and no, no more built up than it is already. <laughs> we sound like real nimbies, don't we? Don't mean to, we just want Bertel to be beautiful, yes, don't we? we do. As beautiful yes. as it can be. Yes. It'll be down to Rochdale planner Rebecca Coley to decide if the cabins can go ahead. We do have quite a lot of, of tourism and we do get a lot of walkers, cyclists and horse riders around the various trails. So there is a recognised need for tourism accommodation and we need to be convinced that it, that it is the right sort of development. If people are very protective over changes to the area they live in, they're equally passionate about any threats to the wildlife in their own back gardens. Usually throw out just three or four handfuls of these birds' nuts. It seems to keep them happy. In this suburban corner of Cheltenham, there's one family that's particularly popular with the neighbours. This is for their supper tonight. That's fish, ham, peanuts and cat food. But when I do them bread rolls, they go wild. Can I have a quick peep out in case he's here? Quite often we'll see the security light next door come on. Um, then you'll hear rustling in the bushes and out they'll come. It's quarter to ten and we have a badger. There are around 20 badgers living in a set on the land at the end of the gardens. Last year we had 11 badgers and two foxes in the drive at one time. That's a sandwich from next door. It's really good, really good, as long as they stay off my lawn. Three weeks ago, developers submitted plans to build on the land where the badgers live. I think that if the planned development goes ahead, um, there's bound to be an impact on the wildlife. Um, that would be a shame. New building land in Cheltenham is so hard to find that developers have persuaded some homeowners to sell parts of their back gardens, a strategy known as garden grabbing. Planner Rob Lindsay is dealing with the housing application that could affect the badger sets. It's a proposal to put up nine detached houses on a site which has been assembled from rear gardens. Developers are having to look at um, several different sites, different ownerships, and assemble them into one development site. Even though they're gardens, the land is overgrown. It's good for badgers, isn't it? Which makes it the ideal home for badgers. Oh, look, feeding bowl. <laughs> Development near badgers has to take place respecting the badgers and their habits, particularly their foraging habits, because they have a main set, they forage from that, and they have outlying sets, and there are two or three of those on this site, so that's one of the major constraints. Construction is sometimes allowed near to badgers, but their sets are protected. 
Any harm to the animals can result in fines of up to £5,000 and a possible prison sentence. There is scope for development as long as the proper procedures are put in place for keeping the, the main badger set active and allowing the badgers their normal foraging. It's, it's a difficult balance. Some people living nearby don't want any disruption and have written in to object to the housing plans. Oh, I love them. If I saw anybody doing anything wrong, I'd be very, very cross. When the wildlife reports come in, the planners will decide whether the badgers must make way for the new housing. In Cheshire, objectors to the proposed crematorium are getting organised. They've formed a committee and even appointed a PR officer to fight against developers' memoria, dress shop owner Rosemary Teeth. I put together a little newsletter for the villagers to look at and I did some little scenarios about what would happen if a child's crossing the road and there's an accident because there's, you know, it's not looked both ways and what would happen if, um, you know, you can't sell your house for three years. The questions that children are going to be asked, why is that black car driving so slowly, Mummy? What's in that box in the back? Where are they going? What are they going to be doing with it down there? Why has it got flowers on it? You know, will I, will I do that with my hamster when he dies? You know, these sorts of things that children are going to be asking these questions and the parents have got to have the answers for them. Memoria have thrust death on our children without any option. It's life changing for the villagers. It completely changes a quiet rural village into we don't, like the, we don't like to think about what. In their mind's eye, when they know there's going to be a crematorium, they don't see this. They see black smoke peering out of these brick chimneys that are going to destroy their property values. Just not true. It's the big taboo subject. We're frightened of death. And that's why we either have to treat it like Dracula or treat it as if it's a comedy. This would be interesting. Planner Judith Gordon is visiting the local council-run crematorium in Warrington. She'll make a recommendation on Memoria's proposal. But she needs to understand the likely environmental impact of a new crematorium in Cheshire. There seem to be a lot of myths about crematoriums and about what happens to bodies and whose remains you get and so on. So I think it's really important to understand the complexity of the service that's provided. Peace. Pins off respects now, the Minister. Yes. He will then in a moment make his way to the store here, as we said before. Yes. Are they like the archers then? <laughs> Each year, the crematorium handles 2,000 services. On average, you're looking at about 18 minutes per cremation. OK. Warrington Crematorium is more than twice the size of the one proposed in Cheshire. As well as considering traffic and landscape, Judith has to look at the possible impact of the incinerator on the atmosphere. This is the operational side of things, okay? On completion of the cremation process, and the remains will then drop down into here, okay? Once they're cooled sufficiently, the remains are then taken from here to the transfer cabinet, which is this here. This is a magnet that you'll gently run through the remains, and, and that magnet will then kind of extract any metal objects, any pins. Okay, so you'll have of, things like kneecaps or hip joints yeah, and things yeah. like that, which will come out and hold. Yeah, you pieces. will physically see those. Okay. Okay. This feels very sort of clinical, I think. To actually follow the process, it's dispelled a lot of myths. You want to look in there, Judith? You'll actually see now that these. It's got a very little left there now. It's not a kind of upsetting thing at all. You couldn't actually identify that there had been a body in there or that it was the remains of a body. I always wanted to be buried. It was my personal theory that I came into this world with two arms, two legs and a head, and I want to go out the same way. Yeah. But now after seeing this process, there's dignity in this, there's, there's, there's cleanliness in this, you know, there's, you know, you can take somebody away. Yeah. Um, so I'm now beginning to rethink this and thinking, well, perhaps cremation is the way forward. You know. Judith has eight weeks to make her recommendation, 
but she won't have the final say. That'll be down to the 11 elected members of Cheshire West's planning committee. In the village of Birtle, near Rochdale, there's an application to build four log cabins on Greenbelt land. Colin Burrell and his friend Mark Harrington are off to see what the log cabins could look like if they get permission. Oh, it's a beautiful setting. Now, anybody that says the door like this, Colin, look at that, there's something wrong with them. These 11 cabins near Bradford in Yorkshire are rented out to holidaymakers for up to £170 a night. Wipe your feet. <laughs> Look at that. So there you go. Yeah, it's very nice. I'd recommend it for an holiday here. A little uh, wood burning store there in the corner. Oh, I'll be asleep all the time. Eh? Hey. King of the castle, eh? <laughs> This is very nice. Very nice. Oh, you've got a thing. But yeah, that's just that's your, um, it's your steam room, isn't it? No, no, what do you call it? Water on. Sauna. No, water on. Sauna. A what? A sauna. Sauna. If the log cabins are built in Birtle, they will stand on wooden stilts and won't need foundations. Even so, the locals don't want any development on the green belt. The, yeah, peop the people who don't want us to do this in Birtle, if you brought them over here and said, hire a coach himself, just come and have a look at this. No, tell me you don't want it. I tell me it's not going to be nice or whatever. I, I don't. I can't, I can't fault them. Back in Birtle, planner Rebecca Coley needs to work out if the cabins would harm the trees and threaten the green belt. We have a tourism officer, and he has written a letter saying that he would support log cabins in this part of the borough. But that doesn't outweigh the fact that it's in the green belt. There are uh, there are other sites. There are fundamentally two issues here. There's the principle of the development in the green belt. Is it appropriate or inappropriate? And then there's the issue of the protected trees, which would be the case whether this site was in the green belt or not. I find it very difficult to comprehend how they're going to get a log cabin on here without some impact on that tree. The roots, the roots are going to be out to at least here, if not further. If you dig down and hit tree roots, then you damage those trees and those trees are likely to die. Rebecca will need to see evidence that Colin and Mark can deliver the cabins without damaging the environment. There you go, Mr. Burrows, take a seat, sir. Take a seat. Enjoy. Oh, yeah, it's just beefed me up even more now seeing this. I really want to do it now. I should, we should have brought a six pack, Colin. No, I'm not bothered about that. I had enough on Saturday. Did you? <laughs> oh, God. It isn't a particularly well thought out scheme, I don't think. So there's a lot of detail which just hasn't doesn't seem to have been thought about or has been thought about and they know that they would have a detrimental impact so they're trying to not mention it and hope that we don't notice I always notice <laughs> don't get very much past me hello could I speak to Rebecca please yes, you. Rebecca it's Mark when Colin and Mark there, read Rebecca's concerns the they decide on a conference call there's no trees coming down at all, n not at any point. But there would be no way of actually getting construction vehicles or actually getting the log cabins into the site. Yeah, we weren't, we weren't really anticipating putting any vehicles on the site, just delivering the materials and they, they would be carried by the workers. It, it, it all comes in pieces, you see, it doesn't, it doesn't come in sections. But how would we control that? We can't be there to prevent your workers coming in and taking those trees out and damage to those trees. And there's other issues with, with the ground levels and drainage and and bin storage and hard and soft landscaping. Yeah. Um, if you were to resubmit the application with the necessary information, you may well be able to address those reasons. OK. Thanks very much, Rebecca. Bye. Thank you. Bye. She's telling him as a layman, saying, oh, yes, but you can't do this, you can't. We can't come back and watch the trees. We can't do that. What a load of bunkum. I just got the impressions that she didn't want it. <laughs> Colin and Mark have an opportunity to submit more evidence to convince Rebecca before she makes a final decision on the log cabins. The planning process can be frustrating, but the consequences of ignoring it can be life-changing. On the banks of the River Dee in Cheshire sits Heron Lodge, home to Peter Johnson. We get prepared for the evening. 
get our logs in, get our fire on, or at the gin and tonic. 73-year-old Peter bought his retirement home near Farndon 13 years ago. It was built in the late 19th century and was a holiday home until he set about extending it and converting it for permanent use. This part of it was the original part up to the uh, brick pier that you see over on the left. So this was the original old cottage. It ticked all the boxes as they say today. It, it gave me a home in the country. It wasn't expensive. It needed a lot of work so I could put my stamp on it. That was my retirement home, that's why I chose it. But Peter always knew that Heron Lodge wasn't perfect. The problems with the river really is that it will come over its bank and just literally flood the whole of the area. You would not believe the volume of water that empties out onto this floodplain. Peter had a solution to the flooding. He got permission to use jacks to raise his house six feet, lifting it out of the floodplain. The cottage was at the same level as the lane out there. We dragged the RSJs underneath the building, four of them, sat them on jacks and literally jacked the old girl up an inch at a time. Probably a little bit of crackers. I think my kids would probably have me locked up for taking the whole project on in the first place. <laughs> Peter had permission to raise the house on jacks, but filling in the land underneath it and creating a small hill around the house needs separate permission, and Peter has had it refused. Now the council's planning enforcement team are involved. I like the idea, in a way, of living next to a river um, and living a sort of wind-in-the-willows type lifestyle, but it would certainly make life very, very difficult, I think, having to put up with regular floods every year. The council has ordered the land around Heron Lodge to be restored to its original level. The case is due to go to court, but Neil wants to see if anything can be done. He has tried to gain planning permission for numerous works carried out on the property, all of which have failed. Um, the only one that he's been granted permission for was, was raising the actual house itself and it's just not an appropriate development within a floodplain unfortunately. The water has to go somewhere and if you displace water from a floodplain then in theory some, someone else can get flooded as a result of that. Peter has no permanent neighbours but for the council it's a point of principle. Hi, Neil Castledon. Hi, Neil. Hi there, hello. Peter Johnson. Hello, good to good meet you. Good to meet you. <laughs> I'm probably wrong side of 70 to be living right out in the country in isolation, but I, I don't want to give it up. Too much blood, sweat and tears, eh? <laughs> I can certainly understand from both angles why it's got to this situation, so I can appreciate why the works were carried out, and I can also appreciate why the council might have felt that, that they, they had to take some kind of action. Mm. Um, I suppose the question now is, is, is how it gets resolved. Yeah. Peter's refusing to remove the raised earth that surrounds the house, so there's nothing Neil can do to prevent court action. I mean, in, in many ways, it's out of the planning department's hands now. Because they've obtained an injunction. Because it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's yeah. headed off into the courts. It is sad, because you, you don't really want to see anyone getting into this level of trouble. But I think he, he did go into it with open eyes. He, he did get advice, and he took the decision that he was going to do something different. I'm an English bulldog. I just hate bureaucracy, and I hate being told what I can do with my own property. The Englishman's home is supposed to be his castle. Having ignored the planners, Peter's fate lies in the courts. And he could lose Heron Lodge if the council insist on recovering their legal costs. My whole life is poured into this project, into this building and this home. After fighting the council for, for 12 years, all the money that I got, that's all gone. I've got to this time in my life and I've been licked by a bunch of bureaucrats which I never thought I'd ever happen to me. 
I could be homeless, I'd certainly be penniless. They'll have to take it from me, yeah. Yeah. Welcome to Badger Towers, and if you follow me, I'll give you a little tour around. We can start with the sitting room. In Cheltenham, plans to build nine houses on the site of a badger set have not gone down well with the neighbours, but they found someone to lead their protest. One of our badgers sitting down here, which is Uncle Ted, and then there is uh, a granddad badger, who's an antique, in fact, and Fritz, dressed in his German lederhosen. Peter Christensen has run Badger Towers B&B &B for the last 13 years. That is Mr Badger. It's right next door to the development site. We have a link to the Badgers in a way because of the name, of course. Um, and uh, we are very fond of the Badgers and of the wildlife in this area. The Badgers have been there for a long time. They are a protected species and therefore should be treated with respect. Mr Badger will fight it to the end. But since the objections were lodged, Peter and the other neighbours have started to suspect foul deeds. You can see across there, there's a bit of overgrown land there, and the badger sets are in there. And so it's difficult to keep an eye on what's happening to the badgers, of course, because people can interfere with them without anybody easily finding out. White smoke has been seen rising above the badger set. Uh, there was an attempt, I understand, that somebody was trying to smoke them out and the police were called and uh, unblocked the set. They didn't actually find any individual, so you can't really point your finger at anybody. But they did come and unblock it, apparently. These suspicions come as no surprise to the developer's agent, Simon Firkins. You can see here that one of the existing homeowners has been clearing hedge trimmings and things like that and having a bonfire on their own site, which they're perfectly entitled to do. And that could be a very, very simple explanation for the smoke that some of the local residents say they've seen coming from the site. Simon's job is to make sure the nine houses get permission and the developers don't fall foul of wildlife laws. OK. Well, here we are in a different part of the site. You can't really see very much because it's so overgrown, but basically the, the, the main area of badger activity is in that part of the site just there. And we've employed a specialist ecologist to demonstrate as part of the application that we're not gonna hopefully do the badgers any harm at all. Um, and what we've got on the plans is a badger exclusion zone. The main set is within this zone here. And so what's shown by this blue dotted line is basically an exclusion zone where we can't develop in or even have any private garden areas in. That is the zone that's going to be set aside for badgers to use as they wish. Obviously, it's in my client's best interests to deal with the badgers on site in absolutely the correct and proper way. I don't think they care. I think what they're doing in this particular plan is paying lip service to the badger population and nothing more. The amended layout and provision of a construction-free badger zone means the planners are happy, so the houses can go ahead. We've got to listen to what the experts on wildlife have to say about it, and we've had a submitted ecologist scheme which says that the, the badgers can be accommodated with the development. So I think you've got to be objective and set aside the emotional side of furry creatures. But there are specific regulations that cover disturbance of protected species habitat and this scheme complies with that. But the number of objections means this application won't be decided by Rob and the planners alone. It'll go before a committee where the elected councillors will decide. In Cheshire, the application to build a private crematorium is about to be considered by the planning committee members. Among them, retired farmer Norman Wright, who lives with his wife June, six miles from the proposed site. 
it can be very busy, but um, it's worth it. It seems worth it. You feel as if it's worth doing it, don't you? Yeah. Worthwhile. You never get any thanks, but you don't expect any thanks. I think he's a very good counsellor. I, I like helping him. people and yeah. trying to sort their problems out, don't we? Yes. Yeah. Norman's been on the planning committee for ten years, including a spell as chairman. We have to read the reports and you have to make that decision, which is very hard sometimes. Hmm. Norman's <coughs> tough. <laughs> 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 The crematorium plans are controversial, but Norman and the committee would have the officer's advice to guide them. Planner Judith Gordon has made her recommendation. I have recommended approval of the application. We've had to consider all the details of the application, the impact on highways particularly, and also whether it's appropriate to put a crematorium on a greenfield site. Um, there is a need for a new crematoria in that particular part of the borough and the need should override any policy objection that there is about it being on a greenfield site. Back in the village, Judith's report is a setback for the objectors. Disappointed, very, really, mm, very disappointed. Mm. There was one phrase that she quoted which I noted down. She said, it will not cause unacceptable harm. harm. So therefore the corollary of that is it will cause acceptable oh, harm. Yeah. And I, I do, I just feel disappointed. But we still, it's the councillors that's going to make the decision. Yes, that's so, I mean, we haven't it? lost, haven't lost yet. yet. Before they vote on the private crematorium, the committee visit the site with a member of the planning team. The site's actually on the, the other side of this hedgerow now. The entrance involves the removal of 20 metres of hedgerow, but no, none of the trees would actually come out. And actually, it's on uh, a good straight stretch of road. So as vehicles turn in and out, there's a good view from both there directions. Is, there is good visibility in both directions. Yeah. It certainly meets the standards for visibility. Yeah. We believe that we have the planning arguments at this site to, to go ahead, which is why we're here. We are very careful to make sure that we, when we have chosen a site, that it will comply with all of the things that we know it needs to comply with. I mean, you could say that a planning application will cost £100,000. So, I mean, if, if you lose one, you've lost £100,000. But support from the planning officer is no guarantee the application will succeed. Councillors can weigh up all opinions put before them. You can't make a decision. You've got to listen to all the, all the arguments before you make a decision. It's like being on a jury yeah. where, in yes. fact, you would not yes. expect the jurors to have come to a decision before they'd all heard all the evidence. Yeah. I've been asked by, by local residents to take you up and drive through Lostock Green and see the access. Our village. That's why they want us to come down here. Yes. To see this sign, no crematorium. But you can understand, it's a lot more traffic. I mean, one has to sympathise, even if one doesn't always agree. When the bus returns to the council offices, the villagers will find out if their protests have struck a chord, and Memoria will find out if it's £100,000 well spent. You just have to wait, and that's probably the hardest bit. At least it isn't a wind farm. <laughs> In Birtle, near Rochdale, a decision has been made on the application to build four log cabins on the green belt. Planner Rebecca Coley has posted the decision online for applicants Mark Harrington and Colin Burrell to read. I would expect yes, because it's an, an, it's making the area better. Whatever anybody said, it is going to make the area better. And it looked nice. Decision, there's a decision. Right. That's the little chap I want. Right, OK. Uh, on the heading there, Royal Council, Metropolitan Borough Council, uh, refusal of planning permission. So they have refused it. The reasons 
Right, the site lies within the Greater Manchester Greenbelt, where the erection of new buildings is inappropriate development. It's not Greenbelt, it's next to a pub, it's like the centre of the village. People object no matter what, you tell them they can object and they will object. The applicant hasn't demonstrated that the works could proceed without having to lose some of those trees. You're not going to get trees. No, but there's roots. Yeah, yeah but that's roots? What, that's I've got more trees <laughs> on my land than they've got there. There are eight reasons for refusal. So it is a lot. Normally, normally there'd only be one or two, but there are a lot of issues with this site. They've taken a chance and yeah, it's not worked out. Clearly, it's something which can't be supported in, in the green belt. There was only ever going to be one conclusion, really, for this one. In Birtle, it's welcome news for Patricia Sullivan, leader of the group opposing development in the village. Fantastic. I'm so happy. I'm really happy. I need to go for a drink very soon. What time is it? It's early. Cheshire, the River Dee has burst its banks for the ninth time in 12 months. Peter Johnson's home is now surrounded by flood water and he's using his boat and waders to get to and from Heron Lodge. You need the fridge and the freezer and the cupboard stocked up, plenty of gin and tonic in and, and live with it. You know, if it takes three or four days a year of a little bit of difficulty with a boat, and it's worth it to live out in a place like this. Despite the flood, the house is high and dry, and that's the problem. Peter had permission to raise the house on Jack's, but he's been told to remove the soil that he banked up around it. He ignored enforcement notices telling him to restore the land to its previous levels. Hello, Justin. Are you all right? If the levels were restored, the house would be left on stilts. Yeah, if you comply with the enforcement notices, you'll finish up with an uninhabitable dwelling that will be totally wrecked. I don't think there's any common sense in terms of making a compromise with Chester Council. Now the council also wants £50,000 to cover enforcement action and legal costs. It's money Peter says he hasn't got, so they're considering seizing his home. It is absolutely stupid. And all I've done is protected my home from flooding. Eh? Does it make any sense? None of it makes any sense. British justice, eh? There you go. Say la vie. Peter's feud with Chester Council has been going on for 13 years but it could be about to end. It's escalated and escalated over the years because he's maintained his unwillingness to do anything to mitigate the harm that he's caused. And, and similarly, the council has, has been unwilling to, to let the matter drop. There will have to be some kind of resolution one way or another. It's really just whether that involves his cooperation or, or otherwise. When the floodwaters subside, Peter's off to the civil courts to see if he can reach a settlement with the council's lawyers. For Peter, it's about much more than just planning. It's an English trait, isn't it, to triumph against adversity. I mean, <laughs> Scott to the Antarctic, um, hunt up the Himalayas, you know, I mean, there's so much of English heritage and English history based in people triumphing against adversity. If I triumph against Chester, I don't think I will, but I'm going to do my darndest to get these blighters on the hook and, and, and expose them for what they are, evil bunch of bureaucrats. The rules are there for a reason, and the enforcement notices were upheld by inspectors. That They've also been through court, and judges have, have agreed with, with the stance that the council has taken. So we're completely correct in, in the approach to this particular case. We can't just let matters drop because they become complicated or long-winded. We don't like serving notices and we don't like sending the bulldozers in, but we have to have teeth. The court hearing takes 40 minutes 
Peter is told by the judge to enter arbitration with the council and find a way to repay the money and restore the ground around Heron Lodge. The judge ordered that there should be a first an attempt to negotiate a settlement to the matter so we can get round the table and talk. Hopefully this will be the start of the end, if that's the right phrase, I don't know. I'm, not, I'm hoping so. One way or another, sooner rather than later, Mr Johnson is, is going to have to comply. Hopefully we can do that through cooperation and negotiation, but if that's not possible, then yes, we will have to consider perhaps more, more drastic options for achieving compliance, but it will have to happen. The planning committee has arrived at the site of the Badger set, where developers want to build nine houses. It's going to be quite a challenge to visualise through this lot, isn't it? The plot is unused land at the end of people's gardens. There's a set there and a set here. The, that X marks a set. These are outlier sets. Sure. This is the main set, sure. and it's the main finished? set that will be kept. The land may be overgrown, but it's an ideal site for the family of badgers that make regular trips into their neighbours' gardens. They're going to close one close. of those two okay. sets and, and, keep that and then reopen that one, and this one remains open. Are they legally so this is the principle. Able yes, to absolutely. This is this is badger legislation or yeah. um, yeah. You know, yeah. wildlife yeah. legislation. I know. A very very strict procedure. We've got six members of the planning committee. You won't come through. Okay, we'll follow me, members. Roger Mulvan and some of the other neighbours regularly feed the badgers. He's hoping videos of the badgers will persuade the councillors to veto the housing plans. Can I break ranks and ask what you feed them on? <laughs> oh, just some bird's nuts. We just throw out a few, because we throw out food for the birds and along came the badgers. <laughs> the planning officers support the scheme, but the final decision will be made by the 11 elected councillors. Well, I'm pleased that the sets are going to be protected, and uh, I'm sure the badgers are. I'm torn two ways. I have to say it was so difficult to see anything there, and it, it, at the moment it's, an, it's a natural wilderness, and anything you do there is going to un um, disturb the balance of the, of the wildlife there. In all honesty, I'm heavily into animal protection, first and foremost, but this is a planning application, so everything has to be taken into account. Opponents of the developers also claim the scheme will affect traffic and involve the loss of green space, but it's the badgers that are their main concern. Well, I've been doing as much research as I can in relation to which areas this application fails to satisfy, and it seems to me there are quite a few. I believe in justice and democracy and fairness. Uh, the council turned down an application somewhat similar to this one four years ago. I can see no reason why they shouldn't do it again. With a speech prepared, Peter will present his arguments to the members of the planning committee. They will have the final say on the development. Thank you, members. I ask... Mr. Peter Christians, to speak in objection. Does this thing turn on, or...? Thank you. Is that better? You have three minutes, Mr. Christians. The plot has an active badger set, and the measures in the proposed plan for protecting badgers do not appear sufficient. There are many other species of wildlife present on the site, and also traffic and health and safety are a further serious issues. We therefore urge the committee to refuse this application. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll now ask Mr Simon Firkins to speak in support of the application. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Members, this proposal does not result in undue harm to on-site ecology, neighbouring amenity, highway safety or the character of the locality. Much of the site is unkempt and it is good to make use of these sites within the town rather than building on greenfield sites elsewhere. I'm afraid I can't see that there's any justifiable reason for refusing consent, and I therefore ask you to support the recommendation and grant permission. Thank you for your time. 
Thank you very much. I'll ask Councillor McLean to address us. You have five The local councillor has decided to speak against the development on the grounds that gardens should not be taken for housing. I mean, I've heard it just said that by permitting these garden grab developments, this one in particular, we will somehow reduce the pressure of new housing numbers. I mean, that is simply, clearly, demonstrably, palpably rubbish. All it will guarantee is the sacrifice of our few remaining urban green heartlands. If this development goes ahead, it will be irrevocably lost. But before the vote, the meeting is postponed for more environmental impact reports. That is deferred to get further advice from the Environment Agency. Thank you. We may not like it, we may not think it's the best development in the world, but there isn't a valid reason to turn it down as I can see. The reports show no evidence of further harm, so when everyone returns, it's straight down to the vote. All those in favour of permit? That is unanimous. Thank you. The plans are passed unanimously. Well done, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. The gardens are gone. The badgers will lose some of their sets, but they will be protected in law. They didn't seem to be interested in the wildlife aspect at all. You know, we have very few green spaces. And just to ignore that it seems to me quite shocking. I was happy that the badgers will coexist with the development. I think the ecological appraisal demonstrated that very clearly. I think that one has been resolved. When you can turn around that corner, my God, it just looks as a funeral. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just said that when the, yeah, when the just was. black. It's the day of judgment in Latch Dennis and Lowstock Green. Well, we think we should give them a taste of what's to come for us. The villagers are dressing in black to attend the planning committee meeting that will decide whether to build a private crematorium in a nearby field. Thank you so much, bless you for that. Now we're on the way. I would say more buoyed than we were in the last week. We just have to go with it and see what happens. If common sense prevails, it will be turned down. But as soon as they arrive at Winsford Council Chamber, they run into a problem. We were coming with a 57 seats bus with all our supporters who've supported us through thick and thin over the last six months and now we've just been told they can't go in. We're told that there's only room for five. Five people. Months and months of hard work has gone into this. Absolutely ridiculous. And we need to have the presence there to show the councillors what the support is. I'm fizzing mad. With so many protesters, council staff changed the order of the meeting and create enough room for the villagers to make their presence felt. So she said, open doors and come in. It's extremely difficult for local people. They very much want to convince um, that they are right and um, that decisions should be made according to their views. Judith has recommended the plans be approved. But the councillors have the power to go against her opinion. I think they feel that a committee may be more democratic because they have elected councillors to represent them. Therefore, they feel that the councillors should take account of their views and that should perhaps sometimes override um, the objectiveness of planning policy. Uh, welcome you all to this meeting of the Cheshire and Western Chester Strategic Planning Committee. First, the objectors get their chance. The planning officer's report suggests this development will not cause unacceptable harm. By definition, this means it will cause acceptable harm. How can anyone truly judge what is acceptable harm other than the village residents themselves? We are not against change in our locality, but it has to be change for the benefit of the local community rather than an out-of-area developer. This is about a development to which most residents strongly object. We hope that you agree with us and reject this application. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much indeed. Next, it's the turn of developers' memoria. 
They've spent over £100,000 on the application. Past experience has taught us that this level of opposition is not uncommon given the perception of crematoria development in this country. However, in all of our previous applications, if we've been given the right to go ahead, we've never received one letter of objection from the local community. Quite the opposite, in fact. With our beautiful gardens and landscaping, we found that we've become a source of pride for the local area. There'll be no smoke, no smell, and the visual impact with the landscaping plan will be minimal. But the benefit to the wider community will be significant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, I, I open this up to uh, debate from committee members who wish... Now it's down to the councillors to make up their minds. Thank you, Chairman. I, I just they need to balance the planner's recommendation with the views of the villagers. It's a very emotive and emotional issue, this, because it's people's lives and it's people's villages. To be honest, I've looked really carefully at this application and I can't find a really good planning reason for rejecting this application, Chairman. I've just rest my case at that. There are not sufficient good reasons to overturn policy and lose good agricultural land. This is not a service that can only be met at that site. Therefore, I move that we refuse this application. Thank you. I'll oh, second that. After an hour's debate, the councillors vote on a proposal to refuse the application on the grounds that it's inappropriate on agricultural land. Right, it's been proposed and seconded that this application be refused. Yeah. All those in favour, please show. Five, six, seven, seven, Any against? Two, seven, two. So the application is refused for the reason. Disappointing, very disappointing. Uh, we obviously, uh, on the back of a very strong planning report, we're expecting to uh, for the committee to support that. We will have to have another look, and if that leads us to an appeal, then we will have to go down that road. That's the best outcome ever, and I know there'll probably be an appeal, but we'll be ready for them. I thought the right decision was made on this occasion. I think the access is not very good. And I think they need to come back with some modifications to the planning application. News of the victory soon reaches the village. That's like crew versus Manchester United, isn't it? The crew win 7-2. If you want to influence the council, Dress up in black. <laughs> Hedgehog flat. Next time on The Planners. The first one will be in this field. It starts there and it runs in a straight line of four parallel to the railway line. A former New Age traveller's dream for a greener future is a castle owner's nightmare. I wake up in the night screaming my head off and my wife says, what's the matter? Wind turbines, I say. Double the trouble for the businessman who wants to extend his cafe. We think they've chosen to lose the plot. And a stairway to nowhere leaves these homeowners frustrated. The builders advertise it as gently sloping rear gardens, yeah? Yeah. With the women on the outside and the men behind bars, a new series of Prisoners' Wives begins over on BBC One now. Next here on BBC Two, a new series of Horizon explains how creative insight works. And on BBC Four now, unsung heroes who protected historical sites, heritage the battle for Britain's past.